Hi, I'm Dr. Lori Watson and the co-host of Foreplay. I'm your co-host, George Fowler, former firefighter, your couple's therapist who loves to talk about sex. Woo, let's discuss everything about the best sexual techniques to building your emotional intimacy, which is really necessary for great sex. We bring sound, concrete tools to reframe your relationship problems and learn how to fall in love again and feel desire. Listen to Foreplay Radio on the iHeart app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Marriage Therapy Radio. I'm Zach Brittle. I'm here with Laura Heck. Today's episode is a mailbag. Uh, We try to answer your questions, and we cover a lot of ground. We want to get to the specific things that are on your mind in a very general way. Before we do that, though, I want to remind you about the workshop that we have coming up. It's called The Art and Science of Love, which Laura and I are teaching for the Gottman Institute. You can learn more about that at gottman.com slash mtr. Um, If you haven't listened to episode 173, there's a lot of information about what the workshop is. Um, as well as a discount code. So go check that out. And for now, let's get to your questions. It's a very cool conversation. Stick around. Are you, how's your head? Shaking it out? Did you shake it out? Oh, oh. You ready? Okay. Did you hear those pops? Snap, I know. That's crazy. Nice job. I don't think my chiropractor likes it when I pop my own neck. Um, I think, I, yeah, that's pre- I don't uh, think, yeah. I don't think, he, and not that it makes his job obsolete, but I just don't think he enjoys the way that I do it. I don't know. He probably has a very know. specific plan for your neck. And probably. You he probably it, does. Yeah. You know, because those guys are <laughs> extremely precise about how they yeah. do. Yeah. So did I tell you why we're recording two episodes at once? Because we you just got done recording. So next week, actually not even next week, tomorrow, tomorrow I leave for the Sawtooth Mountains and I'm going to do like a seven day backpacking trip with my husband and another couple. And it also happens to be our 12 year wedding anniversary. Oh, that's nice. Which, which somebody had to remind me. I think it was my mom. My mom had to remind me that my anniversary was coming up. I didn't know when your birthday was and I didn't know when your anniversary was. So that's how good of a Wait, How did you know it was my birthday? I didn't make any mention of it. Like, yeah, you did. Like two podcasts ago, you made sure that I knew it was your birthday and you said you would be expecting not. a present. Yeah. Oh, I did? Yeah. I didn't. I haven't I haven't been to the mailbox. Uh, so I'll go today. <laughs> it's okay. There's I nothing there anything. for me. I promise. I haven't seen anything come, come through the door. Speaking of mailboxes, I think they should give a prize to the guy who invented the knock-knock joke. Why? A Nobel Prize. <laughs> So I'm sitting here in my office and I'm seeing clients and I hear my son and his babysitter just uh, on the other side of the wall giving knock knock jokes to each other. And my son has this one. It's it's knock knock. Who's there? Banana. You're doing it wrong. Banana who? No, I'm not. Knock knock. Banana. No. (laughs) Banana who? Oh, sorry. <laughs> how do you be, how are you bad at knock knock jokes? Hold on, <laughs> like, hold on. Collectively, Why was I the two doing of us are wrong? bad, right? I, I don't know. I think because I don't know. You probably weren't. No, the third time right. is knock knock, and orange, you say, Who's yeah. there? Orange, orange. and yeah, orange you glad I didn't say banana. This is my, my favorite. Been knock, on that kick. This is my okay. favorite knock knock joke. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, you start it. <sighs> knock knock. Who's there? Banana. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> this is my okay, other new favorite. Okay. So listen, listen, I sent Rebecca to the store to get six stalks of asparagus and she came back with seven. That last one was a spare, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we're broken. I think we're broken. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Hey, right, so mail back today. That did make me feel better. That did make me feel today. better. I told Zach at the beginning, I was like, man, I'm kind of dragging. I don't know. And he's like, well, maybe I'll start off with a few dad jokes. I was like, yeah, that ought to really get me started. Um, um, all right. Mail back. Mail back today. Mail back. You know that Zach and I are huge fans of getting support. And that is why we have partnered with BetterHelp to put you in contact with licensed professional counselors in your area. 
tap into the world's largest network of licensed, accredited, and experienced counselors who can help you with a range of issues, including depression, anxiety, trauma, grief, relationships, and more. With BetterHelp's counselors, you get the same professionalism and quality that you would expect from an in-office counselor. With the ability to communicate when and how you want, whether it be messaging, through the phone, or video conferencing. The matching process is quick but thorough. Look, I know that a lot of therapists are booked out and difficult to get into, but don't let that stop you from getting the support that you need. The cost is less than half of what Zach and I charge, which is kind of unheard of. And when you register with BetterHelp, you are supporting Marriage Therapy Radio. Go to trybetterhelp.com MTR. So it's trybetterhelp.com forward slash MTR to register with BetterHelp. T-R-Y-B-E-T-T-E-R, help, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash M-T-R, and you receive a special discount as a Marriage Therapy Radio listener. Listen, I want to say something about the mailbag. Um, Yes. First of all, people, thank you for emailing us. Mm -hmm. It means a lot. Okay, for the the record... Can we just tell people that there is no response? When you email, there is no <laughs> I response. Think just, I think there's an auto reply that says we're not responding, but we might talk about I it on hope, the podcast. Okay. I hope it says that I don't respond because I, I just can't. I, um, they, they go into a separate inbox and it's all like queued up for us to talk about on the podcast. But I want you to know that I, can't, I just can't respond to all of them. So if you don't get a response from me or from Zach, do not feel sad. But we if you wrote you. us in the last like month, and a half. We're about now to talk we're talking about, about it. Yeah. Now we're talking about you, but I want to say something serious. This is something serious. First of all, thank you for writing us and telling us that you value what we think. And that's important. I think there ought to be people in your life whom you value. Second, it's really clear that people are hurting. People are hurting. And that's, yeah. and that I'm sorry about that. That's really, it's really hard doing what we do, which is living life and trying to do relationship, particularly in stressful situations and particularly over the long term. And so as we address your issues, just appreciate that we, I in particular, I do, I have empathy for your pain. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and I hope that as we respond, that they're helpful because there's, I was going through, I think we were going to do hit maybe five today. And I don't know if we can get through all five, but sure. We can sure. Try. Well, there's a, there are themes, right? There are okay. themes that I think matter. Cause I think the details don't tend to matter. And in fact, maybe that's one thing I would say up top is, when I start to read your emails and you start to give me a lot of detail, a lot of times I start fast forwarding my eyeballs um, mm-hmm. because ultimately the details aren't what's at stake. Mm-hmm. It's the themes that are at stake. And so I hope that today we can help you with your themes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, let's do it. So right. this first one, let's see here. Is it a male who wrote in? This is a guy. This is a guy who is married to a woman. Yep. Yeah. And says that he has had issues with infidelity, uh, whether it's talking to another woman or physical affairs. And recently, sometimes, sometimes emotional, sometimes physical. Yeah. Some, uh huh. Yeah. And then he recently discovered that his wife was unfaithful. Yeah. And when he confided in uh, a gay friend, he discovered his own bisexuality. And, um, there's also and some also, more detail about, um, looking through each other's phones and, um, and just the idea that this guy in particular is having a really hard time kind of trying to connect his feelings to his mouth, like trying to talk about what he means, uh, what he mm-hmm. means and what he thinks. And so again, here's an, here's an is- issue where I read this email and I started like kind of trying to make sense of all the details. And I started going, wait, 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 no, these details are, they're sort of clouding the story. What's at the heart of this? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I'm not interrupting you. I want to hear what you have to say about this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think what's at the heart of it is betrayal, right? I mean, one of the things, and I've said this a hundred times is John Gottman's research is very precise in a lot of ways. There's four horsemen. There's 96% that there's 67% that the only time in all of the research I've ever found that he speaks with like sort of a hundred percent notion is that he says a hundred percent of relationships that are struggling are struggling because of betrayal Mm -hmm. and infidelity Mm -hmm. is a kind of betrayal. Mm -hmm. Um, But so is going through your phone. And so is being tardy all Mm -hmm. the time. And so is, I I just realized I was trying to help a couple the other day. Sometimes 
your bodies betray you and it's inadvertent and it's unfair. Like you get an ADHD diagnosis or cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. That's also a betrayal, right? It's your body betraying you. And so I don't want to be like sort of blankety about it in Mm -hmm. terms of like, oh, it's no big deal. Infidelity is not a big deal because infidelity is unique and it does Mm -hmm. have its own consequences. But what we're talking about here is the con the, the the impact of betrayal um even for a guy who thought perhaps that he had this notion around his own sexuality and found out later that he didn't he had another notion that's a betrayal mm-hmm. of his own expectation and so i think one of the things that we the themes that we need to try and speak to is how do you as how do you laura and how do you listener grapple with betrayal and i'm interested to know what you think I mean, my brain is so in a different place right now, but how do I grapple with betrayal? Well, how, do, how do we help? How do we help make sense of this? This mm-hmm. theme. Uh, okay. For listeners. Can I, can I speak specifically to this particular one? Because yeah, I sure. think that if I'm dissecting here, you said like, here's this gentleman, he confides in a, a gay friend and in the process of confiding and having like this probably very intimate disclosure with his friend who he said, I don't open up very often. I have a hard time expressing my feelings. And now he feels comfortable expressing his feelings to this other man. And in the process starts to discover some own things about his own sexuality. And I think number one is I want to be in the type of marriage that I can come back to my partner and say, Hey, I just realized something really interesting about myself Mm. that I think I'm, I think I'm attracted to men. Mm. That's the type of marriage that I want to be in. The type of marriage that I don't want to be in is where I have a wall up between my partner, my marital partner. And I feel like, Hey, I need to live out either this private part of my life or I can't tell my partner about that thing about myself that I've discovered. I mean, it could be anything. I think we grow and change as individuals and I want to be in the marriage where I can bring those new discoveries about myself as I grow and change to my partner and be able to say, hey, look at this. This is cool. This is new about myself that I didn't know. How neat is that? The part about betrayal here is the the way in which he betrayed it wasn't the self discovery the betrayal was crossing the boundaries with this other man that was the betrayal and i think that having those open lines of communication having that comfort level of being able to talk to your spouse talk to your partner about what's going on for you is really important even the hard stuff that you might come up against of hey and we just did this episode a while ago hey i'm attracted to my um my the a workplace colleague. Hey, I found the barista really attractive and I'd really like to sleep with them, but I'm not going to. I mean, I think that those conversations are so building to the relationship when you can have those conversations with vulnerability and honesty rather yeah. than feeling like you need to betray or put a wall up. So there's two parts of that that I think uh, I would put a pin in. One is uh, the kind of the cure or the treatment for betrayal is cultivating and making uh, or cultivating the kind of relationship where the choices that you make are on behalf of the relationship. They're mm-hmm. not on behalf of a single partner inside the relationship. That's where you start to get in trouble. When I start to protect what's mine, or I start to believe that when I win, she loses or he loses. Um, mm-hmm. What is the thing that's going to help us, us win? The other one is, I think that this particular email made me go, my, one of my responses wanted to be like, dude, you, you probably ought to get some therapy. Like mm-hmm. there's a lot here in terms of like, mm-hmm. whether it's your ability to speak your feelings or trying to come to terms with some, you know, confusing uh, sexuality choices or boundary choices. Like I think individual therapy, I'm more and more convinced is an essential part of mm-hmm. effective couples work. So that would be my... That would be the themes I would hit in response to this, uh, this email that we got. Okay. Um, here Um, comes another one. Ready? Number two. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, this is from a lady whose husband just learned that, that he has a biological daughter from a sex only relationship that was happening before the two of them got together. So this Mm -hmm. adult daughter emerges into his life, um, you know, out of the blue. Uh, And it's very hard for the woman who wrote the email in particular to sort of assimilate and also to share, right? Because she's been the woman in his life for a long time. And now here's this new woman who in this Mm -hmm. case is his biological daughter. And um, Mm -hmm. so 
I, I feel like I, I feel like the email also sort of indicated that the two of them chose not to have a daughter yes. of their own or t- child of their own. A child. Yeah. Um, and so here's now this like really confusing sort of turn on your head sort of thing. And she's grappling with jealousy and fear and anger and being flooded with tears and just mm-hmm. not really sure what to do with about it. So, um, so again, super confusing, detailed situation of uh, kind of a brand new uh, sort of surprise Mm -hmm. welcome surprise in the relationship and how do we how do we grapple with that or what's the what's the theme that we can invite her and others in similar situations to embrace Mm, boy i mean i have to say like this has always been kind of like in the back of my mind that this very thing could could happen in my own life jill let's just be honest like my husband um was much more sexually active early on he i'm sure he has no problem with me sharing that on the podcast um but you know before i met him he was a very popular gentleman and he he really lived his life up and so the possibility i'm really putting myself in her shoes like the potential of having you know maybe a 20 year old come into uh our life an adult child. Oh my gosh, that would be absolutely bonkers. So what would I do? I think the first thing that comes to me is allow that grieving to occur, like allow those feelings. I think that the hard part is the feelings of should, I shouldn't be feeling this way, or I should be feeling this way, or just kind of like getting judgmental about the feelings that are coming up for you. And I think my biggest piece is allow space for all of those emotions to come up, welcome them, process them, move through them at a very different rate as your husband, because this is a very individual process for you and a very individual process for him. And also, you know, we say this over and over and over again about curiosity, being curious and allowing the opportunity to understand what your partner is going through. And hopefully he is allowing himself to be curious and understand what the process is for you to be going through as, you know, the partner that discovers, Hey, by the way, you're now a stepmom. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I, you know, it didn't even occur to me to think of it through like the lens of like, say yours in part mm-hmm. because well, I'm a man and it's pretty unlikely that a surprise daughter is going to show up in my life. Yeah. Uh, like, like a hundred percent unlikely. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. But yeah, that's an interesting perspective. And I, and I think I go two other places in terms of just like the mat themes that I think about. And one is that the job of a parent changes over time, right? When your first baby, when your baby's first born, the job of parenting is keep that baby alive. Mm-hmm. Right. And then it's keep it safe. And then it's maybe healthy and, Maybe a little bit later you learn about keeping it, making it, you know, kind or strong or smart or responsible or independent even. And here comes this daughter, which presents a parenting role. But what is the role of parent here? Because it's Mm -hmm. not keep this kid alive. It's not keep it safe. It's not keep it healthy. Um, But I think that it connects to the second thing that it makes me think about, which is what is the role? The role would be. Mm. Keep it, um, teach it how to be an adult, right? You have an adult daughter that comes into your life and is now you, you have an adult to adult relationship with this person. Mm -hmm. How do we model adult relationships? And that may mean that you have to make some tough choices around, you know, prior commitments, whether it's to your, your spouse or the surprise. I think that does involve some curiosity, but there is a measure of sort of trying to discern how to, you know, how to make sure that this new this new relationship doesn't overwhelm the old one. Um, Because I also Mm -hmm. think about parenting that, you know, like I said, Abby's going to college and it's my job right now to not to be in a family unit at my house. That's really about three people. Mm -hmm. It's not four people anymore. It's three. And Mm -hmm. then it will be two. Mm -hmm. And um, so this family was two and now it's kind of three, but it's really still two because it's Mm -hmm. an adult. So I think that there's some work to be done around both thinking about what is the job of a parent, a parenting an adult, another adult, mm-hmm. particularly if you didn't go through the phases, I can maybe appreciate that you might want to, because uh, I don't know, I can't imagine having this experience, literally can't imagine it. Mm. But then secondarily, right. like, okay, now uh, what does it mean for me to be an adult here and not just defer to maybe some of my more natural instincts? 
Hmm. This is definitely an interesting conundrum. The other piece that helps me to remember is you, you have talked about sort of having this balance between rigidity and flexibility. And okay. when I, when I think about these surprises that happen in life, surprise, you're pregnant and you thought you were barren surprise. You have an oh. adult child surprise, like all of these things that happen or occur, or like you had mentioned, like betrayal, like surprise, you have cancer, like things need to shift. And when we're so rigid and our, unwilling or unable to really allow ourselves to flex and bend with these surprise moments, it really makes life tough. And so what we ask is that you're not so flexible where there's a lack of boundaries and you're not so rigid where they're in, impermeable, but you allow yourself the opportunity to kind of bend in the wind a little bit so that you don't crack in the middle. And I think that's kind of what I'm wondering. And I'm kind of pushing some partners right now who've been together for, let's say, 20 years. And they say, well, this wasn't what I expected. Mm. Well, I mean, I don't I don't think anybody really knows what to expect when they yeah. stand at the altar and they say, I do. Yeah. Um, and having those expectations. But I guess I'm just kind of pushing a little bit and saying, are you willing? Are you able to flex? Maybe not able, but are you willing to flex? Yeah. This isn't what I expected. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. It's probably more mature than what you expected. Um, yeah. Hey, I'm going to leapfrog the third one to okay. get to the fourth one because it's kind of connected. Um, okay. This couple has, um, her question is very specific. It says, based on your experience, is there a single perpetual difference that can break a marriage, even mm -hmm. if both parties continue to try and make it work? Because um, we've had this one problem. And I I don't know what you think about this, but I, I actually do think there's a single perpetual issue that can break a marriage. Do you know what I think it I is? I do too. Yeah. What is it? I well, because I think we're in, we're in agreement. It's whether or not to have a child. Yeah. So no? when he's a hundred percent sure, she's a hundred percent sure she doesn't want a baby and the other one's a hundred percent sure that they do yeah. what one of you is going to feel resentment. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really when it's a hundred percent and you're both a hundred percent clear. This mm -hmm. email is about whether or not to have a second baby. And mm -hmm. so I was like, uh Oh, um, I don't know if I've ever actually considered whether second baby is on the list. Although mm -hmm. again, going through the details, it made me um, think about what to offer here. They have a baby or they have a, yeah. they have a child. She would prefer to have another one. He is not all that interested in having another one. I don't know if either of them are at a hundred percent. So I'm going to make room for they're not, maybe they're both at 99% because that's where we have some, uh, opportunity to offer some input, right? If they're, if they're at 99%, we can go, okay, well, let's play with the one. And thematically, here's what I would do. And I think this is piggybacked onto your, what you're talking about, sort of surprises, like surprise, you have cancer. Right. Again, that's, or surprise, you have a daughter. That's challenging. But I like this exercise for a couple sometimes. I'm like, why don't you try it out? You know, worst Just case try scenario, out, try out well, having a second child. Well, no, but think about it this way. Like um, worst case scenario in this case for him is that his wife is already six weeks pregnant. That is, that's the worst case scenario, right? Okay. Because she hasn't showing yet. Maybe she hasn't taken a test or whatever else, but that's like, that's like the, so try it out for like a week, pretend emotionally, physically with okay. one another okay. that she's sick, that she just came home and said, I'm six weeks pregnant. What do you learn from your body? What do you learn from your mind? What do you learn from your brain that you maybe didn't realize before because you were sort of mm -hmm. stuck in the, mm -hmm. what you wanted, right? Because we've mm -hmm. all seen these videos or occasionally they'll pop up where, you know, she says to the guy, guess what? I'm pregnant. And he goes, no, I mean, yes, yes. No, wait, no, <laughs> no. Yeah. You know, like, like that guy is in real time mm -hmm. hearing Processing. from his body, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And so, yeah. If we're, if we have the opportunity maybe, and we're trying to make a really challenging decision, why don't we just live with it as though it's true for a minute? Okay. And I just, I picked a week out of the sky mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then also try out like, we're not ever going to have a baby. We decided we're done. And if sometimes we can mandate that by saying, we just found out it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Emergency hysterectomy, uh, or whatever, like no, no baby. Yeah. Try it out for a second. What do you learn from your body, from your mind, from your brain? Do you drift over to adoption? Do you start yeah. to make peace with the only child scenario? Like, mm -hmm. I think there's something to be said for finding, you know, to our last conversation, reframes yeah. that help us consider alternatives. 
Um, because I think part of where people get stuck is that they, they don't give themselves permission to consider alternatives. Mm-hmm. Um, Man, this is okay. You, you blew my mind and I'm pretty <laughs> sure I wanted to tell you, by the way, this is just me complimenting you, which doesn't happen. I like to do it on the record so that we have it forever and ever. <laughs> But I have been using some of your language in my work with couples and I've been owning it as if it's my own brilliant language. But I learned so much from you. Do you remember when we were joking about how you're like, yeah, I can be your supervisor. And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) anyway, I've gotten free supervision for the last seven years that we've known each other. This has been great. Um, I was having this conversation actually with, with some partners where they're really trying to figure out. Are we, are we done? Yeah, I'm done. That was it. Cause I might've missed it. it. Uh, The the compliment was, you can go back and listen. Sure. (laughs) That I learned from you that you have some, some intelligence for me to glean from. Um, I don't know at all, but yeah, I, I really, really like what you're saying. I've just played out in your mind as if it was true. Just rather than agreeing to, let's just say your partner comes to you with some crazy offer, right? Like, hey, I think we should um, sell our home. This has been a conversation that comes up like every few years. I want to quit my job. I think we should sell our home. Let's just like live out of a van um, in Costa Rica. Down by like, the river. Yeah. Down by the river. I'm like, Hey, that's an interesting idea. Let's play it out as if that part was true. Like we don't have any jobs. We don't have health insurance. We don't have any, like a home. We have minimal things. Let's play that out as if it was true. And what I like about that is that you're not saying no to your partner. You are saying, Hey man, that's interesting. Let's, let's just live in that reality for for a week. And then you live in my reality for a week and let's just see what that would be like. And I think that's a really, really cool way to be able to take a look at what we would call dreams within conflict, um, where both of you are really stuck in your position and you're like, no, this is really important to me. It's like, great, then let's live in your reality for for a week or a month or whatever it might be and see how that feels. Yeah, I'm into Smart. it. Smart. Love the other it. The thing I would say to her in particular mm-hmm. is... You know, she's crafting this vision for what's a ideal childhood for her current daughter, her current kid. I think it's a daughter. And I just want to say, like, we all know people who have come from idyllic backgrounds and who are miserable and other people who have come from really challenging backgrounds and who are happy. And there's no correlation between the number of children in your home and whether or not you end up being, you know, emotionally intelligent or, you know, satisfied with your job choices or whatever else. Like it really does come down to what do we do with what we've got? Not what do we do with what we don't have? You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Hmm. So that's just a piece of encouragement for that lady. I like it. Do you want to go back to number three? Number three. This is a lady who's been listening to the podcast for a really long time. Uh, she's referencing our interview with Bob Navarra. Bob Navarra Mm -hmm. is a certified Gottman therapist. Who's also a specialist in, uh, addiction and alcohol in particular. And she Which, wants to by ask, the way, can I, can I just add a plug for Bob that he yeah. does pretty regularly offer workshops. They're very limited in the number of couples that he's willing to see, but workshops are a great way for you who don't live in the state of California, because in order to see someone, a therapist, you have to be residing in the state in which they're licensed. But workshops will allow for Dave to see uh, someone from New York, someone from Australia, since we have kind of a global reach with our podcast because we're awesome and you guys are amazing. Uh, Check out his, just Google Bob Navarra, uh, certified Gottman therapist. He's based out of California and he hosts these workshops on a regular basis. Partners on the journey, I believe is what it's called. Does that sound right? I don't know. No, partners in recovery, partners in recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you know of any other good workshops that are coming up anytime soon? Like anything else? You know, that I'm pretty sure that uh, Zach and Laura, are you familiar with their names? Zach and Laura are doing the art. I heard art he's really smart and that she thinks that he's like really brilliant. Super smart. Yeah. That's coming up October 23rd and 24th. You can find information by going to Gottman.com forward slash M T R. Okay. We plugged um, it. Let's talk about this gal. All right. So this lady is pretty sure that her husband has alcohol abuse disorder or something similar. Mm -hmm. And her question, the heart of her question is how do we move forward to have a healthy conversation about drinking without her coming off as controlling? Because the consequences are present. There are consequences to his alcohol use. And, you know, one problem in this space is that 
partners almost never agree about whether or not the use of a substance is a problem. Um, mm -hmm. And often they don't agree about how much the, the other one drinks. So mm -hmm. I've, I've had conversations with couples where I'll say, Hey, how much do you drink? And he'll say, Oh, I probably have maybe a cocktail or two, three nights a week. And mm -hmm. she'll say, Oh no, he has three cocktails, seven nights a week. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't, they're not even on the same page about the actual consumption right. of actual liquid, um, much right. less the impact, right? The impact is, Oh, I wasn't drunk. What are you, what are you talking about? I only had two drinks. Well, two drinks for you is two different is different than two drinks for me. And so mm -hmm. I think the, she's asking the right question, which is the question about the conversation because mm -hmm. um, the conversation has to happen. The reality right. is the relationship that he has with alcohol in this particular email is in the way in the relationship. And yeah. that's a betrayal. I mean, and it's not, mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it just is right back to the top of our question. It's almost like he's having, I mean, if I took out, alcohol and put in barista or coworker, you know, it would read yeah. fairly similar. Um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe with a few swaps, but this is where, again, I don't think the details end up being super relevant, but I guess I wonder what you have to say about the conversation, mm -hmm. if not also about just the role that alcohol may play. Um, so the first thing that I really hone in on that uh, just kind of hurts me, pains, pains me is the, that this is a female that is writing this email and she's saying, I want to have this conversation without coming across as too controlling. Mm -hmm. And part of me Good wants point. to double over in pain because I feel like this is a, um, an insecurity that a lot of women have. It's around mm -hmm. this idea of I'm too controlling. I'm too much. I'm too bossy. Um, and I think that that is just a load of cultural bullshit that I wish that we could shake. And, um, so the first, I just wanted to make note of that, that I don't think that this, if this was a male writing in, I, I honestly don't think that this would be a concern that he would have. I think I'm, you know, like the concern of coming off as I don't know how to talk to my wife about this without saying it controlling. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that the first thing that comes to mind is, um, don't be controlling. Talk about the impact on you talking, talk about yourself in this situation. And if, if you're talking about yourself of this is how I feel, this is the relationship I want to be in. This is what's going on for me. Um, then he can then make the choice. And that's the hard part it, as a lot of times when somebody is using, uh, or when somebody isn't managing their diabetes or when somebody in the relationship is overeating or when somebody is over exercising, I mean, whatever it is, ultimately is their choice. And that's the really hard part. But I think we have an obligation to ourselves to make it clear to our partner, the impact that it's having on you and communicating that to your right partner. On. I think that's right the perfect on. answer. Yeah. Thank time. you. Gosh. Thanks. And then what I would say to him and I'll just say, Hey, man to man, you know, I haven't had a drink in nine months, I think. And part of it is because I, it was very clear to me that alcohol did not give a shit about me. So as much as I wanted to protect and preserve that relationship um, for a number of reasons, made me feel good. I like the taste of bourbon, blah, 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 blah. It just wasn't, it wasn't, it, it didn't care about me. It didn't care about my relationship with my family. It didn't care about anything um, other than um, holding me hostage, I think, you know? And so mm. if he's under the impression that it's somehow... Uh, doing, doing something good. If, if you're under the impression it's somehow doing something good for you, maybe it's not. Because I promise you, it doesn't. It doesn't care about you, um, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna uh, benefit you in the long run in the same way that maybe a healthy adult relationship with your partner may. So mm -hmm. that's just my nice. two cents. It's like man, just your to man, two cents. Whatever. Hey, yeah. here. This is the opportunity that I get. I asked you if I could do this, and um, oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to plug you guys, my favorite non-alcoholic beer. So I still drink, I still enjoy uh, the taste of alcohol, but I have found finally a non-alcoholic beer that is 70 calories. And I can, here's this why. why. Of, this episode of Marriage Therapy Radio is brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, I found that I can't drink beer in the afternoon, which is a real bummer when you want a beer while you're floating down the river mm-hmm. and uh, enjoying your summer because it's knocking me out, probably because my tolerance is really low. So I went to a non-alcoholic beer. I also am doing that for my husband, for my husband's father, who can no longer drink alcohol. Anyway, not um, Athletic Brewing Company has made the best tasting IPA, which I know you and I both enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it actually tastes like, um, kind of like a citrusy IPA. Actually, it's like a full bodied flavored beer. So check it out. You can buy them online. They're available at the Woo Woo grocery stores, like, you know, your nice fancy grocery stores. Like but Chuck's that's my shop. plug. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right on. Do um, we have one more one more question? No, we don't have a question. We just have this very sweet lady named Summer. Aww. And yeah. she just wanted to reach out and simply say, I love your podcast. Your banter and your nuggets of wisdom have seen me through the start of a new relationship mm-hmm. that's now approaching a one year anniversary. And let me tell you, dating tell during you. the pandemic has been interesting. I just wanted to say thanks and keep it up. And what I want to say about this summer is good on you for just putting... Uh, like good into the world. And I think the mm-hmm. world needs more people who are doing that. Like tell somebody today that you appreciate them and that you're grateful that they're in your life and that they add value. Cause not only is that good for them, it's actually good for you. It's actually good for your body to let people know that you appreciate them. So. Oh, I love it. And I already did that to you. So I will wait for I my know. email to come. And I kind of sort of did that to you too. when I said, that's the perfect answer, but. Okay. Uh, Well, yeah. uh, I guess we can count that. (laughs) Hey, um, should we land this plane? I think we did a good job. I think think we did a good job. We we cleared our inbox. We did. (laughs) We did clear our (laughs) inbox. Um, Wish me luck on my adventures on my 12 year anniversary while I am out backpacking with my husband. And I'm quite excited. I think uh, by the next time we talk, I will have uh, had my 24th anniversary. Which makes me married twice as long as you. Uh Uh-huh. And twice as smart because you have that experience under your belt. Oh, man. Wow. The hits keep coming. I know. But here's the interesting part. Didn't we learn or we heard from, oh, I forget his name, the interview that we did, uh, where is it every three years you kind of recycle, re-ups? You're on your eighth marriage right now. Roger Roger Nygaard. Roger Nygaard. Yeah. Yeah. So you're on your eighth marriage to the same woman. Yeah. In theory. Hey, um, That's exciting. Speaking of Roger Nygaard, I need to pitch mm-hmm. you my new movie, pl- my new plan for a movie. So okay. I'll do that next time we talk. Well, if you're looking a, for a documentary a in mind that I think is going to be, it's going to be amazing. Okay, my son will raise his hand to be the first on on screen. He lost his first tooth this morning, by the way. Did I? I'll send you a picture. But this morning he woke up. He said, "Hey, this is really loose," and I touched it, and I was like, "Dude, you better just pull that out." put his hand in, boom, just like that. There was no prep, no warning, no like explanation. He just literally just went dink and then it was out. He's like, look, I did it. <laughs> I can't tell you how bad I wish I had a tooth joke right now. Oh, uh, well, yeah, there's that do. one. We've used it all the time. Go ahead, when do, you do know, it. When it. When is it time to go to the dentist? When you're 2.30. 2.30. When it's, when yeah. it's 2.30. Okay, please put Let's me out of my it. misery. Land right, it, bye. land this plane. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Marriage Therapy Radio. I was also really pumped to be able to tell you about my favorite beer. Um, if you're curious, go to athleticbrewing.com. They are not a sponsor of the podcast, but I am really excited about the new way to just enjoy a non-alcoholic summer beverage. My favorite beer, in case you're wondering, is in the orange can. It's a hazy IPA, 70 calories or less. That's all I have to say about that. I just wanted you to enjoy the things that I'm enjoying. Hey, go give some appreciation, some gratitude to the people that you love today. I I really like that we got an email from a listener that lifts my spirits. It certainly makes Zach feel a lot better when he knows that people like him too. Um, (laughs) You're broken. I know. (laughs) Thanks for all of your time and attention making your relationship better today than it was yesterday. Mm